Hello, I'm Rebecca the Maths Lady, here to help you become a fabulous maths teacher so that all your children are fluent and creative and confident with their maths. This is the seventh video on teaching maths to children in English year one, which is the year they're in when they're five or five to six. And it's all about getting children to count up to a hundred objects and the maths you can do with individual objects. We'll also talk about number talks and estimation games, which are designed to get children talking about their maths and get you listening to what's going on in their world rather than listening for the maths you've already decided they should tell you. And I'm going to introduce you to my penguins. So your children, now they are out of reception or pre-kindergarten, they're all big and grown up and they're ready to be really useful and helpful and the children who do the counting in the school. And they might count things for the cleaner or for the caretaker or for the head teacher or for whoever is happy to play along with this game. And if you've planned this right, you've got pots and jars of stuff around your classroom ready for them to count or things outside that you've thought of that would be really, they really need to be counted. And counting is hard. Children find it really difficult to touch count things and count and say the words at the same rate as that they're touching things. And they find it hard to stop just because the objects have run out. So they are gonna make loads of mistakes and it really doesn't matter because they're five and they're just they're your little apprentices, they are learning. And it's great to have a culture where it's all about kids learning together rather than about getting perfect answers. And as they carry on with their counting and their counting games, you gradually want to nudge them towards the strategy of grouping things into tens to help them see the structure of the numbers that they're trying to count and keep track on what they've done and how many tens they've counted. And if you've done lots of work with the big bead bar and with number lines and with number squares, they'll see the relevance and importance of counting those groups of tens and setting them up. So you can count anything, boxes of pencils, the milk for break time, the fruit, piles of books in the library. Really nice, I kept these duplo blocks that I had with my children. It's lovely to have things that will stack into tens and every ten will be exactly the same size. Pennies are good, although they're not quite as good as Lego, Multilink or Duplo blocks. And all of this is free. You just use stuff you've got lying around. But if you have got a little bit of money to spend, there's one resource that's such a joy. I can't recommend it highly enough and it is my penguins from learning resources. So let's have a little look at why they're so good. So here we have a group of penguins waiting to be counted. And we could count them one at a time. One, two, three, four, five, six. But that's really difficult. You're gonna get lost. But the penguins have icebergs. And each iceberg carries 10 penguins. So we can start to organize our penguins onto their icebergs. And once we filled an iceberg, we know we've got 10 penguins. We can bring in another iceberg. Fill that one up. We've got 20 penguins, beautifully organized. By this stage, you should, children should be confident that they are 20 penguins and we've got another 10, that's going to be 30. An extra one means we've got 31 penguins. And it's even better than that because when you look closely at these icebergs, they've got hooks on one end and hooks on the edges. And what they enable you to do is join the icebergs really solidly so that they become like the big bead bar. You can make a number line of penguins, but you can also join them edge on.
and they become really robust and you can organize them like a number square. So you can make clear links between all the different representations of the numbers to 100 that we've been looking at. And we can do all the things that we've done with our other structures of the numbers to 100. We can count up and down in ones with our penguins or our objects. We can name any number of penguins or objects with words or with number cards to make a two digit number. If a teacher says or writes down a number, children can find that many objects or penguins. And of course, you can check your common errors. Can the child clearly hear and represent the difference between 80 and 18, 30 and 13 and so on? Are they reversing numbers? Can they clearly see the difference between 52 and 25? And you can give them arrow cards if they can't. If anything I'm saying here sounds a little complicated or uses a term you haven't heard of, it will have been covered in one of the earlier videos in this series. So have a look back over those. And they can also do one or two more or less than any number. So by now children will have done the core number work for year one four times. They'll have done it with the big bead bar, with the number line, with the number square, and now with free objects that link back to all those other structures and the children are developing a deep sense of understanding of those numbers to a hundred. But there's something else really cool that you can do with objects that you can't do with those other structures and that is that if we look at a calculation like nine add six our objects can do something rather special. Now how would you approach a calculation like nine add six? Would you get the children to start with the nine and maybe count on six? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You might work with objects in fives and ones. That would be excellent. It's a good thing to do. But our objects offer us a new strategy. Let's just demonstrate it with the penguins. So here we have nine orange penguins and six green penguins to add together. We could say there's nine orange penguins, so that's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And that's perfectly reasonable, but there is a sneaky shortcut. If one of the penguins just moves to fill up a 10, then suddenly the answer is obvious. We've got one 10 and five extra penguins, so the answer is 15. And we didn't have to count on one at a time. Wow. It may seem like an extra nice thing, but it's actually really fundamental for all children that they start to see the sneaky shortcuts of maths, because otherwise our curriculum moves on so quickly that children who've got the sneaky shortcuts will cope, and those who haven't got the sneaky shortcuts and are still counting on one at a time are gonna really struggle. We're going to do most of this work on the sneaky shortcuts in year two and you'll find a lot of videos on this there but it's really lovely if you can start to introduce them. Essentially we've taken the calculation 9 add 6 and we've changed it into the calculation 9 add 1 add 5 by partitioning the 6. We did lots of work on the partitioning numbers earlier in this series and children have to become so fluent with their partitioning of numbers that they can use them for sneaky shortcuts. Of course, it doesn't have to be penguins. You can do that with any blocks that link to make clear tens. Or if you had 10 frames, you could show your nine and your six and move one from the six to fill the first 10 frame and show the five. Or egg boxes, whatever. I'll put in a link to that video. And we can also use our objects to do some fantastic work on estimation. I'm going to get to that in just a moment in this next section of the video, which is on listening to the strategies of children as they learn to calculate quickly by grouping objects, rather than listening for specific strategies you've already decided you want them to learn. So we'll look at two strategies for listening to children in this video today. The first is number talks. A number talk is a mathematical question you set for children where there are lots of ways of working out the answer and your focus is more on the methods children use and them learning to articulate and share those methods than on them getting the answer right. So in year one, a typical question might be, 
How many blocks am I holding? And how did you count them? And in year one, what you're trying to do is create a zone of silence around that question where every child is thinking for themselves and puzzling out what they are going to say. And then you need to pick on children at random so no one knows who's going to be asked and ask them to describe their strategy for how they counted the objects. And you're doing two things here. You're getting every child thinking for themselves. That's so important. Some children always will, but some children will not. And it's those children that you need to activate and switch on if they're going to be thriving with their maths too. And the other thing you're doing is very practical. These children will start to share their strategies for counting quickly and counting in groups. And children aren't stupid. If someone's got a better strategy than theirs, once their strategy has been heard, they'll be listening and learning from the other child. If one child's seen that there were two groups of five and they know that two fives and ten, the other children are going to start to go, oh yeah, that was easier and speed up with their math. And as I said before, they need the sneaky shortcuts or they're not going to cope. But fortunately in year one, they just need to be starting to switch on to learning those sneaky shortcuts. They don't really need them yet. So our second strategy for this video is estimation games. What we're doing here is setting a question that's way too hard for anyone. An adult would find this question hard and we'll set it as a game so it's a challenge, it's a competition. They know they don't have to get a perfect answer. So we show them a number of objects. Here are some of my Duplo bricks. And we let them look at them for quite a long time. And they know that they're going to have to guess an answer and they're going to have to explain how they found their guess. Then we cover them up and we collect people's guesses, but they only get to make a guess if they can say at least one sentence about how their guess makes sense to them. And of course, whoever gets closest gets lots of credit or to go into lunch first or whatever the kudos thing of the day is. And as ever, the lovely thing about my Duplo blocks is that it's possible to link them up into exact tens and all the tens are the same size so that everyone can agree on the answer because you can end up with some arguments if you're trying to count objects of different sizes and it can take quite a while and it turns out that there were 45. If anyone gets that I'd be astonished. Who cares? Amazing maths has been done and these are the kinds of activities that expert teachers do and this is how and why their children thrive and do so well. So in this video, we've looked at working with individual objects in ways that consolidate the work we've done on the big B bar and the number line and the number square in the last three videos. And we've introduced number talks. If you want to know more about number talks, I recommend this book. This is by Sherry Parrish. This covers lots of strategies for number talks and you can get the one with the DVD. There's some excellent demonstrations of teachers using number talks and we've talked about estimation games. Before you leave this video, you should make a decision. When are you going to use number talks and estimation games with your class? It can be as soon as you like. It can fit anywhere during the year. Go on, make a plan, have a go. I'll be back next Thursday with a video about all the odds and ends of number in the year one curriculum. Then we'll be moving on to fractions and then we'll be doing all the shape, space and measure of the year one curriculum. In the meantime, I hope you love your maths teaching. And if you don't, please leave a comment on YouTube about why so I've got a chance to help you. Or in the expert primary maths teacher planning group where you can also chat to other teachers. Bye for now.